Okay, thank you everyone for joining me today. Thank you for selecting that talk. That's uh, one of the first uh, conversations, uh, those light, lightning talk conversations. Uh, my name is Lukas Rados, uh, and I will be uh, talking to you today. I will tell you the story about API protection, especially focusing on the API authorization and access control, access management, and the way we can utilize Dev DevSecOps enabled processes and uh, uh, concept of the microperimeter, concept of the sidecar, to creating that API authorization, API protection at, the, at scale. So a couple of words about me. Um, as I mentioned, I, my name is Lucas Rados. I'm a chief product officer at Cloud Entity. Uh, we are a company residing in Seattle, focusing on the identity access management and API enable and API access management, API security. Uh, in my previous uh, career, I was uh, uh, acting as a solution architect, software architect, security engineer, working with the uh, Fortune 500 companies, advising them around API security, application security, working with companies like Imperv5 uh, and some of the big companies in, in Seattle. So we are at the uh, security conference. So I need to start with the big scary slide to tell you about the you know different about the current reality what we are dealing with. So especially around uh, API security, API protection. So uh, you know analysts like Gartner uh, etc are predicting that API abuse is going to be the most popular ve attack vector uh, for our web applications in the next couple of years. And we are already seeing that that uh, amount of uh, API-related attacks is growing in exponential fashion. And we can, uh, any fast you know, search on the Google will reveal you know, hundreds of those attacks, hundreds of data breaches that were, uh, uh, that utilized the APIs at that attack surface that we, that we have. On top of it, the thing that is really scary that most of the companies actually are struggling with API access management, API authorizations. There are some statistics from companies like F5 and Gartner that are so, uh, telling us that two thirds of the companies actually have insufficient API protection in their production environments. And that combining with the informations that OAS gives us that the most critical vulnerabilities uh, around API uh, protections are related to authentication and authorization. So, so, so this is the something that we are that we are dealing with. And on top of that, if you combine it with the you know the protection that we are getting from the current generation of the security tools, is that you know some of, most of the tools are actually created to protect against things like injections, cross site scripting, but they are not uh, mitigating attacks related to API authorization uh, and uh, that object level authorization and authentication. So that's a, that's a pretty big problem. So how we got here, right? Why it's such a, such a huge problem? It's just, you know, it's uh, our digital economy caused that explosions on API and the ease of use of the RESTful interfaces, etc., cetera, uh, enable us to build faster uh, and, you know, more, user-friendly applications, but the problem is that industry cannot keep up with, uh, uh, with bringing regulations and also security tools to support, to protect our APIs access management. We literally were living in the API Wild Wild West, where every developers or even shadow IT, they are adding new capabilities to their, prod uh, to their products, to their offerings, exposing new types of APIs. The scariest thing that we are seeing in, in our company when we are talking with our prospects, with our clients is, most of the companies cannot even answer simple questions. What type of APIs I'm running in my, uh, uh, in my environment, right? So that's, that's, that's a big issue. Uh, so how we can address it, how we can start fixing it? We are you know, at the OAS conference and uh, you will hear that, that uh, statement a lot that everyone should be a, a security engineer. Everyone should uh, build their applications from the scratch with that security at heart, et cetera. But really it's a beautiful dream. It's a, it's a great concept, great idea, but we are living in the era where there is a shortage of uh, security specialists. There is a shortage of you know, talented uh, developers with experience uh, required to build that secure code in a way. So instead of doing that complete responsible issue shift and uh, approaching everything from, uh, from pushing the, putting that pressure on developers, we should 
or, uh, approach it from the pro uh, perspective of the processes and enablement and allow our developers to build a secure code, but also give them the tools and processes to enable that. So I'm going to be talking about that uh, today. And we can utilize concepts of the DevSecOps approach in authorization access management to enable uh, more secure code in our, uh, in our environments. Uh, so summarizing it, the idea here is that instead of that full responsibility shift uh, between that full responsibility shift uh, and putting that pressure on our, develop on our developers, we should provide them the guidelines and guardrails and enable them to, uh, to be more efficient in their, uh, in their work. So we can do it by those, uh, those processes. So we cannot start talking about the processes without starting with people. So what kind of teams uh, we need to involve by building that secure DevSecOps enabled process? Of course, we need to start with the, our developers. So they're gonna build our code. They're gonna configure, create those uh, configuration artifacts. They're gonna test that code and uh, of course build it and release it. Uh, from the security team, what we are talking about, they are looking at the regulations, they are uh, analyzing what's happening uh, and following what's needed for their particular business vertical. They need to uh, create the corporate level authorization, uh, sorry, cor corporate level policies and regulations and push down those, uh, those regulations downstream. They need to constantly evaluate the risk and decide what's, you know, what's, uh, uh, what we need to accept, what can be mitigated, and uh, the new thing uh, that they have on their table, of course, and privacy and a consent. And thanks California for you know, bringing it uh, to, uh, to states. And of course, before with the GPTR, we had a very interesting keynote talking about that, right? And the last but not least, also that audit and, and visibility, trying to answer a very simple question. What kind of data objects, what kind of APIs my users are permission to access? It's actually a very difficult question to, to answer. If you ask yourself in your current companies, you have a data object that is exposed through the API. Can you actually answer that question? Who actually have access to that data object that is exposed by API? What kind of conditions needs to be met to access that particular object? You literally probably need to go through multiple levels of the security tools, analyze the source code of your application, to be able to actually answer that, that simple hash, uh, question, who has access to what data objects. And from an operations perspective, that team, of course, is responsible for making sure that our services can communicate in effective fashion, that we have uh, all the communications between the services, all the load balancing, service discovery, et cetera, enabled in our environment. Uh, they also can utilize solutions like API gateways, et cetera, to protect, to enable that coarse grain authorization and authentication to enable, uh, to decide who has access to which, which apps. And also something new that is becoming more and more popular, so bringing that externalized authorization concept and utilizing uh, solutions that are starting to emerge in the market especially in the microservices or oriented architecture that enable that fine grain micro segmentation capabilities. Uh, and of course, uh, being able to publish the, those APIs in, the, in a hopefully automated fashion so you don't have to actually go to the tool and click through things or uh, write the code to enable that, uh, that API and expose it in your, in your environment, for example, in your production, your testing environment and of course monitoring. So taking those different responsibilities and those uh, different aspects of, uh, uh, of those three teams, how we can make them work together and take that service that we are, our developers are developing and push it through the whole DevSecOps pipeline and uh, securely expose it in our production environment. So let's take a look. So here what I have just typical uh, pipeline of the uh, uh, from a DevOps perspective or DevSecOps perspective, and let's start with that planning phase. So the planning phase, what we can do from governance, the security team, and operations team, we can take those global policy requirements that can be, for example, simple something simple like every single API, every single service that is processing PII information uh, is required uh, is only it can be only accessed if the user requesting that data perform second factor authentication or authorization or step up authorization. That might be a, corp a corporate level policy requirement. 
That high-level requirement can be then translated into some type of a authorization, declar uh, authorization policy or template in uh, normalized form. We can utilize things like Zacamo, we can utilize things like uh, open policy agent uh, uh, authorization rules language, etc. So we have a different options here, but the most important aspect of it that that our uh, template needs to be expressed in a way that developer can take it and they can build our access policy rules as a code, API policy, uh, a API publishing rules as a code, and object level authorization as a code. Taking those, all of those aspects of our access management at the API level and expressing in a normalized declarative fashion allows us to push that, uh, allows us to push that uh, uh, information to our code repository and also enable our security teams and operations team to utilize regular peer review process to uh, to verify to you know to put that stamp of approval on those on those policies and you know tweak it etc having everything uh, expressed in the normalized fashion in that uh, uh, in that uh, declarative fashion utilizing uh, utilizing uh, you know things like uh, Op, uh, open uh, policy agents or uh, Zacamole or other authorization policy expression languages allow us not only to build the artifacts that are expressing that configuration and utilize that infrastructure as a code approach for our authorization rules, but also enable us to actually automate the testing from a security perspective. So we can take those, uh, take that formalized expression of the authorization and access management and turn it into automated testing that enables our uh, that enables our you know testing team and security team to verify if really uh, we are following our security team regulations and and guidelines from that perspective and of course running those tests in the in our test environment and releasing all of those artifacts uh, and we are releasing those artifacts because those policies are expressed in the uh, in the formalized way we can literally put a signature stamp on them and make to make sure that everything that we are uh, deploying in our production environments, the same thing that we tested in our uh, integration environment. So having that, uh, uh, you know, clear path from our uh, from our you know integration staging to test and to to production environments and uh, running and being able to run that uh, product without our API our sales without without uh, worry that we tested something different in. Uh, in the in the you know lower environments, and of course uh, bring that uh, visual uh, visualization and visibility into what's going on, taking that monitoring aspect, and adjusting our rules if we are discovering some suspicious activities, etc., and being able to create that uh, loop, that feedback loop between our current production environment and our future iteration of those of those products. So this is from a processes perspective. So this is how we could we could do it, and I, and utilizing that DevSecOps approach for uh, externalized authorization and access management allow us to build it at scale. So what about tools? Because we have we talked about people, we talked about processes. So what kind of tools we can utilize to actually enable that uh, that process? So we need to look at for tools that not only will be applicable for, for example, our newest and uh, new generation service meshes, but we are need to also look at the tools that will help us to solve the same problem in our traditional environments. So it's not only about you know, Kubernetes, et cetera, we need to also think about our traditional, uh, our traditional applications, our regular you know, VMware uh, hosts, et cetera, or compute EC2 instances. Uh, and of course, that tool must be DevOps friendly. Needs to enable you to do, uh, uh, to integrate natively with your with your DevSecOps uh, processes. So when you when we are building those applications, those services, microservices, mini services, usually the architecture as a service would look like this. So we have our business logic at heart of the of our system, uh, of our application, of our API that we are pushing to the production. And that, uh, that business logic is protected with a bunch of multi-layer security and authorization things, and also, uh, 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 also logs and open tracing, et cetera. So we are starting usually with the security filter on top. So we have something like um, uh, OAuth uh, 
access token verification built into application. We're utilizing OAuth OEDC as, a, uh, as an enabler, as a platform here. Then we have things maybe like JSON schema validation embedded into that security filter. So we are making sure that uh, only the data that we actually care about are pushed to our, uh, to our application. Uh, we might have things like uh, re uh, brute force protection uh, enabled there, etc. The next level, we, get, we are getting into object level authorization. And this is that brings back that first vulnerability from that top uh, OAS uh, top 10 APIs. So that object level authorization hopefully is embedded in our service, but a lot of, uh, uh, but a lot of companies are struggling with that. So if you look at that, uh, that our service, our API, and you kind of build another and another and another, you will notice that we are constantly rebuilding those uh, security filters, those object level authorization logic. You are uh, re, you know, rebuilding the whole access audit log, etc. So what if you're going to externalize it? What if you're going to utilize the pattern that we know really well from a service meshes, that sidecar pattern, that micro perimeter pattern, that allows you to externalize some of those capabilities into form of the separate uh, runtime uh, package, runtime uh, application that sits next to your business service and enables that secure communication, multi-level authorization. We've done it with the service meshes. We are utilizing things like Envoy micro, uh, micro proxies, etc. The problem is that those service meshes stop at the layer four, stopped at that uh, connection level security, at that communication between the services. They are not diving to the layer seven. They are not understanding. Uh, the communication at the request level. And that's what we need to do. We need to go one step further, bring that transaction level, request level authorization into our sidecar model, into our micro perimeter model. So that's, uh, that's what I'm saying. And what, if we do that, we actually might even learn that our development is going to speed up because not being forced to uh, develop that over and over and over again for all of our services allows us to uh, to move faster, to develop faster, and uh, enable our developer, instead of rewriting that code, reusing all of those libraries, worrying about if the library is compatible with their system, etc., allows them to just define that authorization as a, as a code, uh, as part of their configuration artifacts, and push it into the environment. However, it's not only that, about that microperimeter, about that sidecar, because we are talking about identity here. So the other aspect that is really important, we need to have a supporting architecture around it. So we need to have OAuth server, OAuth IDC server, probably, if we're utilizing OAuth as, as our uh, delegated authorization uh, approach. Uh, we can, uh, we need to have some identity system integration because authorization and access management is all about identity. So we need to integrate utilizing hopefully uh, things like OIDC or SAML, uh, utilizing those open standards. Uh, we need to have an API management repository that allows us to uh, track what we actually have running in our environments. So we need to have integration between the service catalog. Uh, for example, we might be utilizing Consul as our service catalog or, cube, uh, or other products and, util and integrate it with our API management to have that one-to-one -one mapping between, uh, between those systems. And what, that, what, that's, uh, what it does enable us to do, enables us to that, that authorization plane, that the authorization micro perimeter on top of the existing, uh, existing solutions. So that's, the, that's, uh, that's kind of maybe example architecture of, of such, a, uh, such a solutions. The other aspect that we need to solve here is how we can actually pass the context of the user identity or client identity when we, are, we have a communication between the services. Because we cannot uh, call to our authorization engine or to our identity service every single time there is a request. So we need to somehow inject that request into that identity context into our request. And this is where we can, for example, utilize job tokens that can be injected as a header to our RESTful API communication that provide that identity context fin fingerprint that's being injected into our request. So then our micro perimeter authorization layer, instead of introspecting every single request and verifying the user identity, can actually analyze the content of that JOT, verify the JOT signature, and based on the, uh, based on the JOT contact, can perform authentication authorization 
uh, decision. So summarizing that, uh, that talk, I think the next step in the DevSecOps enablement should be focused around API access management, API authorization. And the most important aspect of that is identity. So without the identity, we cannot, we cannot achieve uh, what we are looking for. And I think that's actually my last slide. So perfect timing. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you for much. Any questions? Because I believe we have like five, 10 minutes for, for questions and comments and follow-ups. Hello. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I just have one question. I'm coming from France. Uh, how can companies will really implement the methodology tools with a limit money and uh, and resource? Because sometimes they say like we don't have money for tools for mm -hmm. people. So how can they will implement it? Yeah, that is my question. So that's that's a really good question. And luckily, there is a lot of open source uh, products that are. Uh, trying to attack that uh, that problem. Uh, one of them, there is a, a open policy agent project, uh, which was born as part of the Kubernetes uh, authorization uh, um, uh, work that that was done there. It's it defines the policy language uh, using regu uh, regu uh, uh, rules language and allows you to utilize tools and processes to actually enable that fine grain authorization. Uh, there is, of course, from API gateway perspective, you can integrate uh, and build the plugins to your open source API gateways to enable that. So most of that, uh, those aspects can be expressed utilizing open source technology, which, which is great news. Uh, but how to trust uh, open source uh, tools? <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. So there, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of talk about, you know, can we trust the open source? And I'm sure a lot of people in the, in the audience will agree with that we can because it's... Uh, it's open, open approach, and there is a self-governing uh, kind of a community behind it. So, so that's that's the, that's the thing. At least you have a transparent invisibility what's going on instead of trusting there's a vendor that is promising you something, right? Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Hmm? Source or can you name a few uh, commercial? Uh, yes. Uh, so from a commercial tools. Uh, if there is a couple of aspects. So, so if we are talking about the externalized authorization concepts, uh, uh, the company that was always strong in that is Axiomatics, uh, the creator of the XAML standard. A lot of people do not like that standard because it's XML based. So uh, there is a couple of new companies uh, on the market that are uh, bringing that externalized authorization concept back to the market and focusing on it and trying to reinvent it. It's for example, plain ID. And also my company, uh, provide some uh, solutions, especially around the API access management, and provide and it provides the things like API gateways and micro proxies that en enables you to protect your services and utilize the concept of the declarative authorization uh, to to explain how your service should be protected. Thank you. Here. When selecting an API gateway. Mm -hmm. What types of things do you look for when you're going to make the decision which one's best for you? Uh, that's, uh, I have a bias <laughs> for, for... Well, obviously, the, yeah. the company you work for is the <laughs> yeah. one that you would pick, but, right? yeah, but, uh, but that's a really good question. So when you're selecting the modern API gateway, you need to, first of all, look at that DevSecOps enablement for the gateway. So you need to, lo uh, so you need to look at the gateway can, that can integrate with solution... Uh, uh, with declarative configuration solutions. So for example, if you're expressing your uh, access, API access rules in form of a uh, declarative configuration in your, Git, uh, in your console or your, or your Bitbucket, et cetera, that gateway needs to be able to consume that data directly from there. So there is no that manual intervention. So for example, you don't have to log in somewhere to the console, click through things, upload the configuration manually. It needs to provide that. It needs to be lightweight. Uh, it needs to be something that you can actually deploy locally in your in your environment. It does uh, so it doesn't have to be in the in someone's SaaS, SaaS uh, offering, etc. Because your gateway needs to uh, need to live as close to your data as possible. Even even if you are talking about just regular ingress gateway in the service meshes, you want to have, for example, that ingress gateway running inside your Kubernetes cluster as an ingress controller, etc. So it needs to be agile, lightweight, DevSecOps enabled. Enable high performance, uh, needs to enable uh, uh, ability to extend it by adding your custom plugins because that's uh, something which is also really important. Uh, 
So that I would say, yeah, those are kind of the things that are important from an API gateway perspective. And of course, things like, you know, JSON schema validation, security filters, brute force protection, uh, and uh, rate limiting also kind of a critical capability in the API gateway. As a follow-up, mm -hmm. could you answer the same question for service mesh, or are they sort of the same? Uh, service mesh, uh, I would say that's, uh, that's a very similar answer to that. I think from a service mesh, there are several, we, we are, it's kind of an interesting situation with the service meshes because we can, we, we call it in our company, we have service and mesh wars right now because we have, of course, big ones like Istio uh, based on Envoy. We have a lot of ones that were created based on Envoy that are utilizing Envoy as a proxy. Uh, like, for example, Consul Connect from HashiCorp uh, that is utilizing Envoy proxy, but they have a little bit different, different approach there. They are, for example, they are trying to attack that high hybrid multi-cloud aspect. When Istio is just Kubernetes, Console Connect wants to enable you to run everything uh, everywhere and protect it the way you like it. Uh, Linkerd is an interesting one. So, so it's just a question, test it, see what works for you, uh, and uh, go with it. That's, 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 that's my, that's my sol uh, solution here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe just taking a step back in this whole evolution how, how do um, IDPs and IAMs kind of fit into what you're talking about here? Because I think some people may mm -hmm. be confused between, you know, the approach you're describing and maybe mm -hmm. using other commercial tools or, mm -hmm. you know, for um, identity and access management. And, uh, so that's a, that's, a really, that's, a, that's a really good question. So uh, what we are seeing in the market, marketplace right now, most of the companies, most of the big enterprises are standardizing, utilizing OAuth uh, and OIDC for the API access, uh, authorization at least. And as long your IDP supports modern OAuth flows, you should be good. And when I'm, and I specify modern OAuth flows because I believe there is another talk happening at the same time talking about the OAuth 2.0 vulnerabilities. Uh, so we learned a lot in the past, uh, uh, years, uh, how to build the secure API authorization, you utilize OAuth delegated authorization model. And we learned that things like a resource, uh, uh, like resource owner password flows, implicit flows are unsecure, etc. We added some extensions, like for example, pr uh, proof of code exchange, Pixie into authorization grant to enable some of the flows. So as, lo so as long your identity provider supports those modern OAuth tools, you should be good because it's, uh, it's much more standardized, looks much better now than it looks, looked like, for example, three years ago. It's much easier to integrate your, uh, your API gateways with your uh, identity providers, regardless if you're using something like Okta uh, or uh, uh, Microsoft uh, Azure or, I don't know, Ping Identity, et cetera. And those vendors are slowly catching up with those newest OAuth trends, et cetera. And uh, there is a lot of interesting innovation around OAuth and API authorization, around, especially around OIDC and, and OAuth, as part of the uh, Financial Data Exchange Foundation. Uh, they are focusing how to actually utilize OAuth-based uh, authorization for financial and highly sensitive APIs, and they are pushing a lot of uh, innovations around them, bringing things like uh, intent-based patterns to OAuth, uh, bringing financial API compliance uh, to OAuth, etc. So, okay, right. I think that's it. Thank you very much. I appreciate you listening to me today. Thank you. Thank you.